All right, good, good morning. Good morning. We are going to um, continue on. This will be probably our last week, uh, Lord willing, on uh, justification. Remember, what we're looking at here is the order of salvation. Fancy Latin words, ordo salutis. And it covers everything from election, predestination, to glorification. Eternity past to eternity future. And we're kind of camping out here with justification. You should have a handout there in, uh, in front of you. But what I want to do is open with, um, with just a few verses from Romans, and then I want to pray. Likewise, the Spirit helps in our weakness. Talking about suffering and the future glory. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your word here. Uh, we've heard it. Uh, your spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Um, we thank you for his ministry, his advocacy. We thank you for the advocacy of our Savior, whose blood and righteousness is sufficient to to cleanse us from all of our sin, to clothe us in what makes us acceptable in your sight. We thank you for the righteousness of Christ. We, we thank you for the Holy Scriptures now as we consider certainly our church's confession about justification. May we uh, search the Scriptures to, to back up what is said, what is claimed, what is confessed. And may we know your word, uh, not only your word in a greater way, but, but your Son and his love and, and us and our own sin and and our future hope uh, that is secure in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when you think of the Spirit helping us in our weaknesses, you know, obviously, um, John, 1 John is great. John's at the end of his life, and he writes, um, he's writing, and he says some wonderful uh, verses. Listen to this. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Um, so obviously we know Christ is righteous, but the language of advocate is very important because often what you have happening when Jesus says, I'm going to send another one to you, a parakletos, we, we often translate the Spirit as being what? A comforter. You know, sounds good, right? We love that. And He does comfort us. Amen. God is the Father of mercies and the, the God of all comfort, right? 2 Corinthians 1. But really the language there is He's an advocate, The Holy Spirit is an advocate, another advocate. I'm sending another comforter, no, another advocate. The Spirit advocates for us according to the will of God. Like in a major way, in a major way. You saw the passage I just read. We don't know how to pray. The Spirit intercedes. He searches our minds and hearts. Like all these amazing things that he might, to what end? Advocate for us. Means end end. It's a beautiful thing the Spirit does. But what we're covering here. Order of salvation. So I want to touch really quick on this. I want to revisit kind of this thing, this union with Christ. You guys ever heard that before, union with Christ? Like it's a big, all the in him language that you see in Ephesians, uh, for us language. So really, when you think of union with Christ, the tendency is to think of, um, there's really three aspects of it. There's... Um, There's the existential, the experiential union with Christ, okay? And when you think about that, that, that happens the moment certainly that we believe or that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. There's another aspect when you think of the union with Christ, and it's the decretal aspect. You think of the decretal aspect. When you think of God's eternal decrees, our, our God's decrees in eternity past, 
chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons. Right? So it's this eternity past choosing decree, God's eternal purpose, whereby according to the counsel of what? His will. He foreordains what whatsoever comes to pass. Creation, providence, redemption. Whatsoever, this God who works all things according to the counsel of His will. Eternity past, there's this decretal union with Christ. Okay? And the thing about this decretal union with Christ is, is what? God's going <laughs> to do everything for your salvation, including choosing you in who? It's very important that we're chosen in who? This is key, right? Ephesians is replete with that. Predestined. Romans just mentioned that. But then when we get to justification, the, you notice the language in the confession about eternity. We're not going to get too bogged down in that. But, but um, I'll just read four, and we'll talk about that. Look at four. God did from all eternity decree to justify all the elect, and Christ did in the fullness of time die for their sins, rise again for their justification. Nevertheless, they are not justified until the Holy Spirit doth in due time actually apply Christ unto them. So what's the ground, the ground or the basis of our justification? It's really going to be this federal union with Christ. Are you guys with me or not? Don't be shy. Can you explain what existential means? Yeah, so... Christ in you, the hope of glory. You've been sealed by the Spirit for the day of redemption. When did that happen? Did that happen when you were in your mother's womb? Maybe. That's very rare. John the Baptist, it happens. Okay. Did it happen at the baptismal font? More than likely, it didn't. Okay. But it happens through Spirit-created faith. When your heart is regenerate, your heart of stones turn into a heart of flesh. That happens through the external word of the gospel that's preached. Right? And then you believe. You believe and you're what? What happens when you believe? You're sealed with who? God the Father, who are you sealed with when you believe? Who are you, who are you sealed with when you believe? F minus. Sorry, maybe that's me, a bad teacher. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is none other than the Holy Spirit of who? The Spirit of Christ. It's the Spirit of Christ. So this existential, it's all the benefits that you have, like comfort from Christ, illumination from the Word. Are the grounds of all those things, really, even now, come from the, the Spirit who lives in you, who testifies that you are what? Children of God, right? Romans 8, 17. Let's, listen, let's just listen to this, uh, this passage here. For you, to, eight, Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive a, the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. So you think of that language. When did you receive the spirit of adoption? When you believed. Does that make sense? So the spirit of adoption, when you think of this language, this is uh, a little bit later in um, 1 Corinthians 15. Pastors starting 1 Corinthians 15. Um, <clears throat> Thus it is written, the first Adam became a life-giving being, right? Remember? He was, how did God make Adam? How did he make him? Dust of the dirt of the ground, right? And then he breathes into him, what? Nefesh, and he, which, and he becomes animated with a soul. And then what does he do? He has some kids, Cain, Abel, you know, Seth. The first Adam became a life-giving being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. You're like, what? Who's the last Adam? The Lord Jesus Christ. When did he become a life-giving spirit? At the incarnation, during the righteous life, after he ascended on high? Yeah, when he ascended. Remember, he who comes after me will baptize what? With the Spirit. He pours out the Spirit. He becomes a life-giving Spirit. He's still the incarnate God, man. He's still incarnate. He's ascended, risen, uh, ascended, exalted at the right hand of God. And He pours out His In these last days, God will pour out His Spirit on what? Remember Joel's prophecy? On all flesh. 
all believing Jew and Gentile, all nations, Christ, the life-giving spirit, pours it out, and it becomes yours. Remember, um, the Romans passage talks about how we didn't receive a spirit of slavery to fall, uh, to fall back into a spirit of fear, right? Did you notice that passage? You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. When did you cry, Abba, Father? <laughs> Lord Jesus, save me, right? That's what we cried. And then, of course, the spirit is regenerating, working on us, and then, of course, sealing us for the day of redemption and, and uniting us to the risen and exalted Christ. That is the existential union, when you're united to the risen and exalted Christ. Does that make sense? And all his benefits become yours. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, but that isn't the grounds of your justification. Nor is it the ground of your justification isn't even God's choosing you in Christ. The ground of your justification is this federal aspect of our union with Christ. When I, think, when I say federal, th one of the key things of Westminster Presbyterianism, and I'll just kind of read it to you from Romans 5. Just turn with me to Romans 5. We're going to work through this passage. Remember, we're talking about justification. What are the grounds? What are they? Give a couple, give a couple options. Is it your spirit wrought holiness? that makes you declared not guilty and righteous before a holy God? Is it the faith decision that you made that, yes, yeah, so you have, or, or is it something, or is it the works, the righteousness and death of another? That's what it is. So we're zeroing in. When you think of union with Christ, there's three aspects to it. There's the eternity past, decretal predestination. There's the federal aspect, which is what we're looking at. <clears throat> which is the God-man taking on flesh as a federal head, or you think of federal means like representative. Can you guys say representative? representative. So you guys are like not used to Presbyterians. Can you say representative? Representative, representative. you guys get it, because you're, you're asleep and I'm, maybe I'm teaching bad. Representative. Head. Federal. There's two federal heads to all of humanity. Do you know who they are? The, the real danger is when we want to be our own representative before God. Hey, you know, I kind of got it together. I'm not as bad as these other people. I've made a decision. I've been going to church a while. I'm a good husband or a good wife. I do all these good works. And you know what? Maybe so. Okay. But there's two representatives before God. Just two. Who's the first representative of all of humanity? Adam. Adam very good. Very good. And when we think of Adam, the, the language is, is really interesting. Let's, let's look at this in Romans 5.12. So when you think of um, the language is either you're in who? You're either in Adam. Or in Christ. Yeah, and you're in Christ. And that's cool. That's like good religious language. Okay, being in Adam, what does that mean? Let's look at that. Let's try to understand what being in Adam means. Therefore, just as sin, I'm in Romans 12, came into the world through one man. Who is the one man, guys? Don't be shy. Adam. Adam, very good. And death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Now, <laughs> That seems a little confusing, right? Like, what is Paul talking about? For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Well, then how could God count sin in the first place against Adam if there's no quote-unquote law? Is that a confusing question? Or did I read that and were you guys like, I'm hoping he answers that. I hope he's not afraid to answer that. Or who cares about that? The, the law or the, the, the command that was given to Adam, you know it was it was a lot of different commands. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the creatures, right? Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So that was, that was kind of the law or the command. We call that in Reformed theology, the covenant of works that was given to Adam. And of course, what does he do? 
Yeah, you think of the language in the Christ hymn in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Read it a little bit later. When you see Jesus coming in, he humbles himself to take on the form of a servant. But he doesn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. Harpogmos, give it to me. And you think of the temptation that, that befell Adam and Eve. Was they considered equality with God what? Give it to me. The, the, the test or temptation that beset, beset Satan and a third of those fallen angels. Give it to me. I want to make my, I want to become like the most high. So that's the temptation. But of course, that was the sin that caused Adam to stumble. Any comments or questions before we keep going through this? I, I kind of, that's an interesting point. I kind of respectfully disagree there because if we read Genesis, we, we remember Adam wants nothing to do with God. Right? That's, so that's, to a certain extent, that's right. That Adam wants nothing to do with God because when God steps on the scene, what are Adam and Eve doing? Oh, well, they're hiding. They have their fig leaves on. They're like hitting the deck. And God comes like walking in the cool of the day. And so there's two different really takes on that. Is he like coming in to judge and to condemn? Or is he coming in to like patiently entreat and lovingly cajole and and compassionately like find out that he might restore them. He's going to judge them to a degree too. But the takes is God's coming down like an Adam and Eve are like hiding. Or is this God of love like kind of stepping on the scene to initiate reconciliation? And the reality, Jim, is that Adam and Eve want very little to do with God. Now, why do they want very little to do with God? Time to shine, class. That's a question. I'm not going to answer it. Why do they want very little to do with God after they harpogmos that apple or peach or whatever it was from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why do they want very little to do with God? Think of the last time you sinned grievously. What did you do like 10 seconds after the anger or the act or the compulsive off the deep end purchase? I don't know what your sin is. Or the look, that you say, oh, God, please forgive me. No, what'd you do? Exactly. Yeah, no, 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 no. Christ isn't sufficient. No, he came for the righteous. We believe the same thing sometimes, unfortunately. So they were guilty, right? So to be an Adam means to be what? Guilty. What else? Let's come up with, a, the, there's a, in sin, yeah. There could be shame, but you also have people who, who in Jeremiah who forgot even how to blush over their sin, right? Remember? They forgot even how to blush. Should be ashamed. Um, guilt, sin, condemnation. What else? Let's fill in the blanks. Good. Dead. Very good. And we, we that's a great, that's terrible writing. Spiritually dead. Very good. Okay, so to be an Adam, you, you check in the boxes. Death. Cond whose condemnation? God's. On what basis? Sin. Why? Guilt. Do you, you kind of follow the progression? So you have to like, do you want to be an Adam or do you want to be in Christ? And so back to Jim's point, Adam and Eve wanted nothing to do, or Adam wanted nothing to do with God, or God wanted nothing to do with Adam. Not, not quite, because God comes to him, and you can look there. Maybe we'll just go to Genesis real quick. Genesis, this is just a great little passage here. Great passage. And Jim, you bring up a great point. A very good point. So God comes to Adam in the midst of his shame. Remember, <laughs> where's Adam? He's got the fig leaf on. And what is, what is he? He's, in, he's, he's spiritually dead. He's in sin. He's condemned. And he's guilty. So yeah, absolutely he's going to hide. He's blown it. He's blown it. And before God who's done nothing but good, nothing but love, nothing but provide, nothing but care, nothing but say, hey, have everything you want except this. This little one test is a test of your fidelity, your loyalty, your, your love for me, the one who's created you, who's formed you. You have everything good because of me. Are you going you gonna to pass the test? That's good. What do you guys think of what Larry said? I would say, yes, it is. Absolutely. But why? Why does Adam have knowledge of God's holiness? It's not just like one answer. There's a couple different answers. Adam, why does Adam, here comes a hint, why does Adam in the image of God, in the likeness of God, have a knowledge of God's holiness, even if God just kind of zipped his lips and didn't say anything to him? Exactly. He stamped it on his heart. That's like Romans language. When the Gentiles who didn't, was Adam a Gentile or a Jew? <laughs> Gentile. It's kind of a joke, okay? Terrible joke. <laughs> it's early. See if you guys are awake. 
When Gentiles who do not have the law, right? Paul says that in Romans 2. By nature, do what the law requires. They show their law unto themselves. They have the work of the law written on their heart, and their conscience bears witness to it. And so, I thought that was an earthquake. I was ready to hit the deck like Adam and Eve. <laughs> they have the law in their heart. The law basically says, love God and love neighbor. And you think of, there's this great book called The Marrow of Modern Divinity. Great book, old, old book. It's a dialogue between a, a legalist, do this, this, and this, and this, and live. An antinomian, hey, we're saved by grace, we don't need to do anything. A new believer, hey, what do we do to be a Christian? Can you believe it if the new believer was left with those two cowboys? Oh, that'd be the worst thing. And so then you have this evangelista, this like, this godly pastor who knows grace, who knows the gospel, who knows the law. And it's this dialogue between these four. And then, of course, there's this Puritan named Thomas Boston who has all these notes in the margins to kind of even correct and, and further um, elucidate all the points they're making. But what he says is when Adam ate that, ate that, the tree, when he disobeyed God's command, he wasn't just dead spiritually, in sin, condemned guilty, but he broke all Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. I think he says, like, he had no other God. He was a God to himself because he decided what was right and wrong. Secondly is um, he he's worshiping his belly mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than God, right? Don't make things in my image. Third, he took the Lord's name in vain when he believed him not. Fourth, they were in, like, this eternal Sabbath. Or they were in this, they weren't in an eternal Sabbath rest but they spiritually weren't condemned and they violated that rest because they plunged, they, they plunged us into sin. Fifth, honor your mother and father. He dishonored his father, God. He disobeyed his command. Sixth, thou shalt not murder. What did he do? He did something to harm himself and others. <laughs> himself, Eve, and who? Thanks, Adam. <laughs> Plunged all of us into sin. Seven, adultery, spiritual adultery, right? <laughs> Stealing, he took that which wasn't his. Lying, what? He's lying against the truth. Coveting, he took what, he, you know, he wanted it. He wanted it and he took it. Just amazing, right? So back to Eric's point, Adam in the image of God with the law in his heart, how does he know he's guilty? Because he's in the image of God. You have the law in the heart, you know. The law tends, we tend to summarize that as being the Ten Commands of love God, love neighbor, love yourself, like, he blew it all. And, and Jim, you bring up a good question. Did God want nothing to do with him after that point? And we say, well, of course not, because God steps on the scene. And we see it's not just to strike him down and start over. God, God calls him out. They make a, bunch, make a bunch of excuses. And then he gives the gospel. Yeah. So Jim has, brings up a good point. And this is, this is very important for us. So Obviously, I respectfully disagree with, with Jim there. And so how do we adjudicate between, you know, my opinion and Jim's opinion? We just have to go to the Word. So let's go to Genesis 3 and let's kind of look there. Did Adam, did God just leave Adam and Eve, like, at arm's bay? No, he comes, he gives them the gospel promise, right? He also gives them a fair amount of, uh, you reap what you sow, curses. Curses the serpent. Verse 15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. We're in Genesis 3. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Okay, there's the gospel, okay? There's the gospel. But let's look at this. Hey, Eve, childbearing is going to be difficult. Adam, cursed is the ground. All these difficult things. And then look at verse 20. Let's look there and try to understand kind of what's happening. Can someone read verse verse? 20 for us. Just verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Okay. So remember, remember what he named her the first time. Okay. So all the animals, it's like funniest, one of the funniest verses in scripture. God parades all the animals in front of him and Adam's uh, having dominion or righteous rule over them. He's naming them. And then of course he has no fit helper. I'm back in like chapter two. And then God says, okay, go to into a deep sleep. I'll grab this, this rib and make like this beautiful being, woman. Well, he does, it's not woman. God's just going to make a helper suitable to Adam. And so when Adam wakes up, like in verse 23 of chapter two, he is so excited. But let's see what he calls her. Okay, let's see what he calls her. Verse 22, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Time to name this one. <laughs> the man said, 
He's so fired up in the Hebrew. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So man's ish, she shall be called isha, right? Just easy name there, right? Just piece of cake. He knows this is his wife. No sin, nothing but pure holy thoughts, glory. What God's created men and women to do in marriage, right? And then there's marriage. And then there's, you know, then there's the temptation and the sin. So why does he rename his wife? The man called his wife's name Eve. Remember, where's that? Where are Adam and Eve? Dead spiritually. They're in sin. They're condemned before God and they're guilty. So if God has nothing to do with Adam from the time he falls, they stay this way. And it's terrible. Hiding. Fig leaves on. So he renames his wife what? Exactly. Now, why does he do that, though? Like, why does he say, okay, baby, I'm going to rename you from woman to Eve. Why does he do that? Remember, she's not the mother of all living. Hey, honey, have some of this. The, you know, the woman you gave me made me eat it. Yeah. So he, so he, heard, he heard, okay, sweat of the brow, right? Right? Uh, cursed or childbirth is going to be like, Pretty hard. It's number one way to die during the time of Christ. Childbirth by far. By far. And he focuses on none of those, really. You know? (laughs) But he focuses on the gospel promise. And he names Eve in the midst of sin, condemnation, death, guilt. And and it's not just that he knows the promise. he He trusts the promise. He trusts it. He has faith. The first believer, you could say is Adam and, of course, Eve. They believe the gospel. Genesis 3.15, they hear the gospel. In the midst of, it's not just 3.15 and that's it. They hear a lot of other very difficult words from God there. Big time. Yeah. So, remember, it's the faith is in response to what? Don't miss this. And the promise is a promise of what is it? It's grace. Now, when you think of grace, we always talk about this. Unmerited favor, really demerited favor. Favor in the, in the face of ill desert. What do you deserve, Adam? You're not neutral as this promise comes to you. You're condemned. You deserve hell. You, you're dead spiritually. You're guilty because of your willful sin. And God's promise is merely of grace because God is a God of love. And so the fact is, God pursues them so beautifully and so amazingly. And he gives them a promise. And of course, the Spirit brings that faith about. But they trust it. They trust it. And you see one of their sons trusts it too. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. So good. That's so good. Even Cain and Abel and their sacrifices, right? Why isn't um, Cain's sacrifice accepted? It's not a guilt offering. Say louder, louder, louder. It's not a guilt offering. It's a thank offering. What does Cain bring? You remember? Does he bring... He brings his own effort. He brings like thank offering, like fruits of the ground. Now look what happens after Adam and Eve believe. Verse 21 of chapter 3. And the Lord God, you think, uh, made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Like, again, that's that's getting a little more particular into how the the heel is going to be bruised. Do you see that? That's like a sacrament. That's one of the earliest sacraments. Sign, things signified. The sign of the tree of life pointed to eternal Sabbath that awaited should they be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and not take the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They wouldn't have been like perpetually on probation. Maybe they'll fall in 2019. No, it wouldn't have happened. God would have confirmed them more than likely in their righteousness. But the fact they blew it, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil even is a sign of, will you be loyal to the Lord your God? Him alone will you serve, will you trust, will you believe? But of course, this here with the, with the animal skins, what has to happen? Just God finds some animals lying on the ground? So it's, it's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that God takes initiative. And you think blood is shed? <laughs> Very gospel-centric here. Garments of righteous, gar- you'll clothe me in garments of salvation, Isaiah's prophecy. Like, this is like the first little like mustard seed of that. And of course, hey, here's my gospel promise. You believed it. Here's a sign. And so here come Cain and Abel. 
sons, listen, we had it really good. You know how hard it is when you're caring for those animals? And this is speculative. Test me on it. Um, you know how hard it is when you're tilling the ground, Cain? And they're like, wow, really? You had all that? And then you ate? Tell me why you ate again. I still don't understand that, mom and dad. No, no, you're missing the most important part, okay? We were... We had these fig leaves, we were hiding, and then the, this God of love and of grace and of justice, of holiness, came to us, and he gave us this promise of the gospel that, that, that this offspring of Eve, of your mother, is going to come and crush this head of the deceiver. You know, he's going to have his heel bruised. You know, I renamed your, your mother from, from Isha to Eve because she's the mother of all living. Here you are, you... You've been created, and you must believe this promise. You guys are sinful. You disobey us. You talk back to us. You, you, you come in early from your work out in the fields or among the cattle. And who believes that promise? Who believes the promise out of those two? Abel. How do you know that Abel believes the promise? Yeah. Barry, you can't answer. Yeah. You're too smart. You're too smart. How do we know that Abel believes the promise? Yes, and why though? Why? Is it just because he has faith? Because remember, they both bring sacrifice. Is it just that one has faith? The right way. What's the right way? Good, Bruce, you're nailing it. What, what kind of sacrifice is it? Bloody sacrifice. Blood, exactly. Garments, God clothed us in these garments. He shed blood because you know what, son? I deserve to have my blood shed. Your mother deserved to have, you deserve to have your blood shed. God provided this. And it's just a God, it's so beautiful. So absolutely God had everything to do with them from the time they fell. Even Cain, your brothers, you know, do, do well, you will live. It's just amazing. God's just pleading. So back down to this federal union with Christ is, of course, exactly what we're seeing in, in verse 321. The federal, the ground of our justification is the garments and the blood. It's, it's, it's the God-man obeying in his flesh, bearing the curse, bearing his sins in our sins in his body on the tree, the one who is pierced for our transgressions. That's the ground of our justification, okay? Ground. It's not you and your works. It's not your faith. But it's this, this God-man who fulfilled all perfectly and who bore the curse in our place. If that's the ground. Oh, go ahead, Jim. You can get the last word. Yeah. And you think, that, think of the, the sore that's going every which way. Probably a holy cherub. Like, you know, no way back. You, you don't get back to this tree of life by just, you know, climbing up Eden again. It's a mountain. They go east, down the mountain. All the rivers flow out from Eden. You, you don't get back to God's favor, and you don't get life by climbing the mountain with your own works and your bootstraps. That's a great point, Jim. That's a wonderful point. So God seals it. He exiles them. And you know what? What's the way that we think is to life? Another person's works? and No, we think it's our own. <laughs> Even today. That's why we need to hear the gospel every day, every Lord's Day. Because God, like, it's constantly, like, reorienting us to His glory, the glory of God in the face of Christ. The, the, the gospel, what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians? It's, it's, he likens it to, to creation. Listen to what he says. Um, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts... To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And he says before that, why, why do people not believe the gospel? In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So you think of the gospel being the glory of God, the light of the knowledge of the glory of the God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we are so prone to say, no thanks. I think I'll look here. I think I'll, you know, bring this and that to the table. It's like our default setting. And you think of like, we think of like sin, adultery, stealing, coveting, lying. Like to, to, to fail to behold Christ in his grace for you 
It's not up, the gospel's not up there. But the point is, it's outside of us. And that is the glory of God. The glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That is the clearest depiction. The gospel is the clearest description of the glory of God. And it must be like what we behold by faith. Sometimes the faith is strong and we get it. Sometimes it's very weak. And you're hanging on by a mere thread. And you're prone to look everywhere else. Other people's uh, approval of you. Your own thoughts about your own self-approval before God. No. The glory of God in the face of Christ. That's what saved Adam, Eve. That's what saved Abel. As they looked to that in promise. They had a lot less of an excuse than we do. What do you want to add, Larry? That's good. And we don't have to work too hard to suppress it because it's very foreign to us. I'm sorry, Bruce. You can, no, you can call true. me up. It's so true. We, exactly. Because it's an external word of promise that's not inherent within us. Naturally, we don't think to ourselves, in ourselves, of our, oh, I'm thankful that God shows mercy and grace and sent his son. No, absolutely not. We never come up with that on our own. Yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah. And even if we did think we needed it, you think of natural revelation, creation, God exists. You know, he's magnificent. There's beauty, conscience, like Eric brought up image of God. This is what he requires. Even if we thought we needed it, we would go those three ways, the way of mysticism. I just want an experience the way of works. Let me climb back up that mountain or the way of what? speculation. I wonder what God's like. Oh, he's not really that bad. He'll accept me. Do you, do you get it? So it's, it's, it's an external word, which is foreign to us because of all we're left with our internal words is those three false ways that are the ultimate U-turns away from God. Mysticism, the way of works and the way of speculation. And that's why it's so important that we have, what do we have? And another advocate, the Holy Spirit is another advocate to kind of drive home these, these promises of God's grace and of his mercy to shoot us straight about how much we need it. You sinner, yes, okay. Thank you that there's a savior for me. And it's, he's the, the other advocate. Um, so all that to say, remember, the union with Christ, um, to be an Adam is to be spiritually dead, in sin, condemned, guilty. Now, to be in Christ, of course, is what justification is, is about. Yeah, I think we don't just like sin. I mean, the, the, the scriptural language is there's temptation, there's desires. So sin is like a little farther down the line when we think of actions of sin. Of course, as it relates to sin nature, that's another thing. But Adam and Eve and Cain and Jesus... And us, we all know temptation. Big time. In a major way, we know it. And James talks about, you know, <laughs> you probably don't want me to read James. Um, listen to what James says. <laughs> Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Did Christ ever have trials? Absolutely. Absolutely. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. You think of Psalm 1, the whole paradigm of, of Psalm 1 is, you know, not to sit in the seat of scoffers and to go the way of, like, folly. But, you know, blessed is the man who, what? Trusts in the Lord. And this, this of course, Christ is that blessed man in whom we are all blessed, who empowers us by his spirit to walk in the way of blessing and obe obedience and God's blessing. Blessed is the man who, who remains steadfast under trial, trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. That's, that's interesting, isn't it? Think of, <laughs> you think of the test. How is how's James characterizing our life as Christians? One big trial. Not that I'm like a, a Johnny Raincloud. There's great joys and blessings in this life. But you notice, he says, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. We've all passed tests. I don't see any crown of life on us yet, right? True. That's to come. Which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted. I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. 
Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And then, of course, every good thing comes from God. And then listen to how God, this is another, uh, talks about the power of the word here. Do not be deceived, my brothers, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Listen to this verse. Of his own will, he brought us forth. How, James? How? He brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, when you think about that, what's the word of truth that brought us forth? <laughs> what's he mean, brought us forth? That caused us to have life, that caused us to be born again. It's the gospel. Why are we first fruits of his creatures? Well, because Christ has undergone the trial and the test and was obedient in every way. That's what, read uh, 11.3 later. Christ, by his obedience and death, did fully discharge the debt of all those that are justified and did make a proper, real, and full satisfaction to his Father's justice on their behalf. Twofold justice. Twofold justice. We'll close here. Guilt for your sin, the justice of the death that you deserve. Cross. Justice you, of obeying in every way, standing firm through every trial, always doing the will of the Father, always obeying the, the word of God. Christ fulfills that aspect of the justice too. And of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. That's the gospel. And not only does Christ fulfill all the justice of the righteous life and the vicarious death, but then he has this victorious resurrection that, of course, is the very beginning of the new creation. And who are you all here? We look, all of us, I mean, looking haggard today sometimes, right? More than others. But we are new creatures. The very first new creation was Christ's resurrection. That inaugurates kind of the new creation. And that's important to keep in mind because it's essential to the gospel that he was raised for our justification, Romans 4, 25. That the gospel's about his death and his resurrection because he's like the first fruits and we who believe enter in into that victory and that inheritance and that blessedness. So um, any comments or questions before we close? Westminster. Um, Going to stick to the confession, Lord willing, next week. <laughs> Good question, though, Jim. I think that's important. We need to go back to the Bible and see these things aren't just, like, first of all, in some confession, and second of all, not just in the book of Romans, right? They're, they're woven through the, the, the scriptures from the very beginning. Um, let us close in a word of prayer. Our Father in God, thank you for the holy scriptures that, that are able to make us wise into salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word of truth. Uh, the gospel. Um, we thank you for, for Christ, who, who is the image of the glory of God. It's in the face of Jesus Christ. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, thank you for the Spirit who is our advocate. Um, minister to us by your word and spirit. Uh, continue to do so, even this hour as we gather to worship. May we hear the gospel, that promise, and may we be May our eyes be lifted to you who is our help, who is a strong tower about us, who is a, a, a fortress for your people. May we, may we flee to you yet again and cling to Christ as he comes to us in the gospel and rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.